in the space of glo global communication, where we have the potential now for a almost universal communication, for pe people can communicate continually now, we're experiencing censorship uh, to an unprecedented degree. We're experiencing polemicism and polarity. We're, people aren't willing to listen to a, a, an alternative perspective. We are siloed into our particular echo chambers and at a time where there could be more communication, more unity, more, more unification and more acknowledgement of the likely unitary force that underwrites all consciousness that we are each an individual expression of, people are more and more infatuated with, in, with individualism. So in this work, The Creative Act, a way of being. I know from the part that I read that you said that by um, the more we are willing to become our personal selves, our authentic selves, the more we will discover the universal, and that there's a kind of a fractal, re there's a, an implication of a fractal reality inferred there, that by becoming who you truly are, you will, f you will make universal connections. How's that going to be possible when we live at a time that's defined by surveillance and censorship and, uh, the, and conflagration and the amplification of our differences? I'm just referring to the cultural war and the actual war that's taking place now. And, 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 and May I ask, Rick, how do you interface with those, let's face it, somewhat political and cultural arguments as, a, as an artist and a creator? Well, it's always been uh, an issue that's been around in the, the first time that this, uh, I came in contact with, with this was in the 80s, uh, living in New York and starting to make music, the, whatever the um, mainstream forces were trying to censor the type of music I was working in and wanted it not to exist. They didn't understand what it was, and that was hip hop. So hip hop was originally uh, verboten, and it was not played on any radio stations. And it was uh, it was pe people who did it were unpeopled, and it was unmusic, and whatever it was, it was bad, and it was evil, and. Um, and now it's the most popular form of music in the world. So that gives me some sense of uh, assurance that when people come together in, it, to do something good with a, with a positive, you know, the people who are making hip hop were doing it out of love for this art form and having something to say. And maybe these are people who never went to a musical academy or um, were great virtuoso musicians, but they had something to say, and they had an experience of life that was different from others, and they wanted to express it. And they expressed it in a very, um, a very elegant, beautiful way that if you weren't part of it, you didn't understand. Now, over time, people have come to understand it. And now it is, uh, it has taken over the world. And it's fascinating to see. And at the time, in, in the early days, I could have never predicted that, that rap music would be what it is today or that it would ever have even been popular because it was so, it was such an underground form of music and uh, reviled. To see it live where it lives today is, uh, again, reassuring that something good it comes around like the 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 forces that are trying to hold down goodness um they're not strong enough to do it they're not strong enough to do it whilst i am excited by your perspective that something that was esoteric particular literally ghettoized has become powerful and ubiquitous my concern is that it became that through a process of commodification and commerce. When you're dealing in the alchemic realm of creativity, 
Do you, what do you feel about the necessity for commodification? Like, you know, that something's only really regarded, or am I right in assuming that, you, that do you regard things only as a success once they could become commercialized and commodified? And do you think the original art form loses something as a result of that process? Do you think it becomes sterilized? Because, you know, like the, the, the history of rap and hip hop is one that at its origin felt like a transgressive and dangerous movement that provided a voice to the voiceless that are articulate that mobilized a kind of uh, a, you know a, a, a movement that was yeah previously sort of oppressed and invisible exactly as you say but that that, that, that but that, that acceptance is achieved ultimately through financial success which it seems to me comes with a degree of nullification and neutralization it will Concerns me. What do you feel about that? Am I off track, Rick? I, I don't. Th I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's true what you're saying that as things grow, they become commodified. But both you and I are practitioners of transcendental meditation, and transcendental meditation is something that could be taught for free, but you pay for it if you want to learn it. And Maharishi made a point of saying. If you, if we want someone to take this seriously and to honor it, it has to have more value than free. And he said, if someone's not willing to pay to learn meditation, what they're willing to pay for a refrigerator, then they're not going to treat it in the same way that they, and with the same degree of commitment as they do to using a refrigerator every day. So there's something about it. Now, it doesn't have to always be the case. And yes, when we're focused on commodification, it can undermine everything. And so much of what the book talks about is ignoring commodification, essentially, um, in the making of art. So in terms of in the making of art, we cannot think about commodification. We cannot think about commercial aspects. Once the art is made, my interest is for the most amount of people to be able to experience it. And if they're willing to pay for it, and if they feel good about paying for something that they that they want, I support that, but that's it. You know, that's the nature of the, the, the commodification doesn't come before it's, we're not making things to sell. We're making things to be beautiful. And then if it turns out there's a market where people want them, it's fine to sell them. Now, I'm not, I'm not anti capitalism in that way. It's just when the, when the cart comes before the horse and it only becomes about commodification that you know, you turn on the TV and there's a bunch of terrible stuff on. It's because people who are making it are making it with this business idea. They're not, not making it with this artistic content. We want to make the most beautiful thing we can make and nothing else matters. It's made by committee, what people think will work. Um, all, all things that undermine the potential beauty of the art that's being made. So I try, I've always tended to, throughout my whole career, I've only tried to make the best thing that I can make that moves me. And then in the hopes that if it moves me, maybe it'll move someone else. But I don't think I'm smart enough to project, I'm going to make something I don't really like, but this seems like the kind of thing someone else would like. It's insane. And that, and it seems like that's the, the majority of the output of the, the, um, the, the mainstream commercial artistic output is just what somebody thinks somebody wants to see. Yes, I think it becomes inorganic at that point because, as you say, it's a, a project of commodification. I suppose I'm speaking about this in particular in an environment that it seems to have been completely immersed in an ideology, not just in music, but in culture and in sport, that we that our it, it, all of our creative endeavors might be regarded as invisibly undergirded by commercial imperatives that, as you have explained, the artist cannot engage with and consider themselves still to be an artist rather than a kind of trader. But you used the example of uh, transcendental meditation and it, that makes sense, the idea of exchange, the idea of valuing, that those ideas, Value. those, yeah, those, those tools are not necessarily of themselves bad but but i have concerns about the commodification of spirituality and specifically this rick that in a sense 
uh, uh, contemporary spirituality, new age spirituality, which is the sort of area both you and I, if we're not cautious, could be categorized as operating within, uh, is a, a spirituality that, in my view, is uh, guided implicitly by the principle of meditate, you will be a better unit in the system. Meditate, you will become a better, you know, in order that you, there's a telos, there's the presumed telos that you should meditate, do yoga, take ayahuasca, do whatever it is, so that you can function better in this system. And this system isn't, it seems to me, you know, like some of the things we've touched upon at the moment, the inability to communicate authentically, the uh, ongoing censorship, polemicism, uh, a stoked conflagration between different groups, the needless cultural war, the co constant posing of traditional ideology against progressive, you know, socially and culturally progressive ideologies in order to create hate because of the way that social media has evolved. You know, look, that spirituality, in a sense, you know, like, uh, this is the quote I think that helps. We have been taught that free Freedom is the freedom to pursue our petty, trivial desires, but real freedom is freedom from our petty, trivial desires. And that for me, as a person that, you know, I'm governed by appetite so much, I am all mouth, all mouth. I want, I want, I want. You know, I, I've become spiritual because otherwise I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to myself, I'm going to take drugs. If I don't awaken, I'm finished. So like, you know, for me, when it becomes about, become, you know, learn to meditate, so ultimately so you can fit within a system better, it concerns me. So I wonder if there is something necessarily uh, uh, that creates compromise, you know, whether it's in music or spirituality or anywhere. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are perhaps with spirituality. Well, it, you just said something very interesting, which is your reason for uh, getting into spirituality for yourself had to do with uh, controlling of your appetites. And I imagine, so that's what got you in. Now that you're in, is that all that it's about? I'm guessing not. I'm guessing you found something that resonates with you on a deeper level, and it's not just about that. And it, I'll tell you, I've, I had a friend who uh, originally used to go to yoga classes because there were a lot of girls in yoga classes. And he thought, if I go to yoga classes, I'll meet girls at the yoga class. And then he started doing yoga every day to meet girls. And then he became a yogi. And it, it, I, he may have even become celibate because he it, it didn't matter what got him in. It's like the seed was planted in him. And once the seed is planted, I, I think when 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 we're young, we think about I want to be a rock star. I want to be famous or I want to do this. And then it gets you to start. But once you start, you realize it's about something completely different. You realize it's about um, one, of, one of the things I talk about in the book is when we're when we're making art, it's it's not even about the end product that we think it, we think it's most artists think it's about the song I'm recording or it's about the um, the movie I'm making. But really, it's a connection to something outside of ourselves, a greater source of creativity that we're tapping into that we get to feel part of. And we're part of this like uh, universal communication that's going on. When you really get deep into creativity, it's not really us. We're just, part, we're just vehicles through which it happens. And in the early days, you don't know that. It, it's something that, that comes over time and mastery. The more you do it, the more you see, ah, this isn't really me. This is not really me. This is not by my hand. My hand's involved, but only as a vehicle for something bigger than myself. And um, th there was something else that you said earlier about um, about worrying about the commodification of things. And I think about your your show. So your show has gotten very popular now. I have no fear that you're going to change your show based on what would, in terms of commodification, benefit the message. In other words, if someone got you to change your message because you could make more money doing that, I don't have fear in you, in you that that's going to be the case. The movie Network is about that. I was thinking about that as you were saying it. You know, the movie Network, Howard Beale has these uh, incredible 
revelations and he's this wild character and then basically the the corporation tells him that's not how the world works it doesn't work the way you think it works corporations run everything and you're part of that and he went along with it he he didn't he didn't stick to his original guns he he uh in some ways he was undermined by the corporate interests so i i don't have that fear with you Thank you. I mean, that's a high praise from you because you are regarded in this culture as almost authenticity personified. You, I, I think you are like a cauldron for it. You are where people go to be healed. And, I, and this is just like as a voyeur, it seems that that's the relationship that artists have with you. So I'm honoured that you would say that about me because there are times when I... Because I talk about subjects on this show about like corruption, about the military industrial complexes, possible incentives in a war that's being portrayed as humanitarian. And of course, there is a humanitarian aspect because people are suffering and dying and the simplification of, of the narratives around war and what happened in the last couple of years, the pandemic and trying to stop short of stuff that's cons conspiratorial and not underwritten by good information and good data. Sometimes I... Um, you know, because I'm dealing with these things and I recognize I have to convey them in a way that's consumable and accessible and scintillating, I every so often forget this is actually bloody real. You're actually talking about things that are real. And there's a sort of a necessity for a kind of spiritual hygiene when dealing with these matters, Rick. And it's sort of challenging because I, like, and, and I, I must say, because I'm a person in recovery and because I believe in God, I have to, I keep this at the forefront. I'm fallible. I'm a fallible, flawed individual, and I, I never let that stray too far from the forefront of what I'm dealing with. I try never to be didactic. I try never to, because I know that I don't like people talking to me like they think they're cleverer than I am. And I try to remember that. And I've learned because of the touring aspect of what I do for a living, that most people want to be left alone. Like people want guidance, people want instruction, but people don't want to be told what to do. They, we want to be free. People want to be free. Um, Absolutely. Th yeah, thank you for, for the beautiful compliment. A moment ago, when you talked about this feeling of grace in your work, of knowing that there is something moving through you, can you uh, tell me a few examples that come to you in your working life where you have felt the evidence of that, the bliss, the joy, the playfulness of being touched by Krishna or Christ consciousness or ho however you uh, feel it and describe it, in, in, particularly in your work? It, it happens all the time. And an example would be uh, a band will be playing a piece of music and it sounds uh, ordinary. And it's ordinary for a period of time. They play it over and over and over again and try little changes, try little differences and nothing. And it doesn't really change it's ordinary. And then sometimes something happens. And when I say something happens, not because we had a great idea or changed something radical where it, it all of a sudden what's happening goes from pretty good to extraordinary and nobody involved knows what's different and none of us have any control over it it's miraculous when it happens when and there are certain certain artists who are able to tap into it more more easily but red hot chili peppers are an example of when they play it's usually good but they can reach these levels of musical transcendence on a very regular basis like like uh not every time but a lot a lot and it's wild being in the room for everyone every, every, we're, every we're just kind of looking at each other like kind of dumbfounded because you can't believe what's happening I've had it. I've had it happen in the studio with Carlos Santana. Where he's playing, he's playing, and um, it, it just seems like it's not coming from him. It's it's this beam of music that's happening in the room, and the people there aren't even playing it. I've had it happen with Nusrat Fatali Khan, where when he's singing, his mouth isn't moving in the same way that what you're hearing do, do you know what i'm saying like it's like an out of sync movie where his mouth you're hearing these sounds and his mouth is not making those sounds 
and it's just this otherworldly presence in the room. I can't explain it. It's just, it's stunning. Neil Young can go into these states of just disappears in the music where he's gone. And it's, I don't know what to say about it. So I get to see it on a regular basis and it's magic. And all we can do is um, recognize it when it happens, be respectful of it, be thankful, um, and do anything we can to set the stage to allow it to happen, but never uh, be arrogant enough to think that we can ever make it happen because we can't. It's, it's some other energy happening.